see you all. Uh, today, uh, we get to uh, move into uh, chapter four of the human condition. This is, uh, this is I, I'm of the opinion that this is one of the most important chapters and, um, and one that's really worth uh, paying a lot of attention to. It's, it's short, um, shorter than both labor and action. Uh, but but especially uh, important, uh, and that is true, especially given the kind of focus that we've had in the last couple of meetings on the importance of the idea of a world for Hannah Arendt. And so I want you to, as you as you go through this chapter, um, really pay attention to the idea of world. Um, the the payoff of the chapter, uh, where it really uh, comes to make its most sense, is in chapter section 23, which we'll talk about next meeting, uh, where Hannah Arendt talks about the work of art. And so, something to keep in mind as we as we talk about this is that the the highest the highest manifestation of work, and thus the most worldly uh, work, is the artwork, and um, we can then also say that within artworks, there's also a, a hierarchy and the essence of work and what makes work so important is that it's durable and that it lasts. And thus it creates or helps populate a shared world that unites people who are otherwise singular, plural, and different. And if you think about it, in that sense, all works degrade, temples degrade, artworks degrade, but the works that are most lasting uh, for Hannah Arendt are, are stories. And so stories are the, uh, are the highest um, and most worldly and most durable form of work. And thus the poet or the historian, the teller of stories, uh, is for Arendt the uh, the highest uh, manifestation of a worker and of work. So, um, uh, with that sort of basic introduction in mind, I, I guess I'll say one other introductory idea, which is that we should remember that the chapter on work uh, is the second of three chapters in the middle of this book on the human condition, uh, in which Arendt is um, articulating three conditions of what it means to be human as being human has emerged over the last few thousand years. They're not human nature. It's not something that is part of a genetic, natural uh, idea of man, but there are three activities of man that uh, have come to condition what it means to be human in, in the history of, of, of our of our people in the last few thousand years. And they're all part of the Vita Activa, thus the inversion of an older idea in which contemplation was higher than activity. Uh, and the, the history of the last 2000 years since the Greeks has been the inversion of that so that the Vita Activa uh, transcends the Vita Contempliva and action uh, replaces contemplation as the highest uh, idea of, of human life. There's a second inversion in that, which is that while for most of the last 2000 years, work and action have, thought, have been thought to be higher than labor, labor which was seen as privative, labor which is seen as necessary, Arendt is going to argue that in the modern era, and the modern era begins largely in the 17th century with the scientific revolution, which we'll start to get to today, we see the vita laborans, the anima laborans, the idea of labor, elevating itself over both action and work. And so you should be paying attention to the way in which that's happening as well. Um, and that will be something we talk about throughout this chapter, and then talk about quite a bit a lot in the very end of the book in section 42, 43, and 44. Um, so in many ways, 
these chapters are super important to understand the end of the book. Uh, and so we're going to, to, to I hope, have um, a productive conversation about them. Um, chapter 18, the first chapter on work, simply uh, tries to set out the basic ideas uh, of what work is and how it's distinguished on the one hand from labor and on the other hand uh, from action. Um, the key word uh, here is durability, and it's not an accident, uh, and it's the durability of the world, which is the title of chapter 18. These titles, I, I hope we're figuring out, are important. She, she, she puts the main idea in the title, and, and we have to try and understand that. But if you look at the first few pages, durability and stability and solidity are, are, are used over and over again in these pages. The key idea is that um, when we labor, uh, we create products of consumption that we consume. And the, 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 you know, the core example of labor is bread, right, or food. Uh, you labor, you make food, you eat it. That food largely disappears and it doesn't have a, a lasting impact on the world. Uh, it's not an object, uh, and she uses object in the traditional Latin meaning of object, objectum, to throw against, which in German is the same, gegenstand, to stand against. Uh, an object is what we create through the work of our hands that stands against us, that um, becomes a thing in the world that we interact with on a lasting and durable level. So um, there are numerous examples of objects, of things, of work. Uh, one is a table. Um, and you can imagine a table uh, that you sit around for dinner every night with your family, or you sit around weekly with your students. And that table becomes not just something you consume, although it will eventually die and, 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 and go back to being wood or, or decompose, but it becomes uh, something around which memories form. It becomes an object that orients our class and our world, uh, its shape, its feeling, the way we rub our hands along it when we're thinking. Um, the table comes to, to serve a purpose. And if it's a particularly nice table, uh, we may hand it down to our children when they start their own house and they will remember growing up with that table. Um, and uh, the table thus has a kind of durability that creates a world that even though our children are different than us and they may eat, you know, pasta every night, whereas we ate steak or they may, you know, eat kale, whereas we used to eat potatoes, something about the table unites us and keeps us in a common world. And that's the truth with family heirlooms, with, with, with a family house. Uh, it, it, it's a, a pocket watch that you inherit from your grandfather. Um, it's things that are durable and last lasting. Uh, and as I said, the things that are most durable and most lasting are artworks, things that we um, really do try and preserve and we don't use up. Uh, and that have no other use except to be things we look at or recite poetry or stories. And in reciting them, we don't have a use except that they help create a common world that unites us amongst our differences. And so um, what work is, is the uh, activity of artificing, artificing making, uh, fabricating um, uh, objects, gegenstands, things that stand against us, that persist and are stable in the world over a long period of time. Uh, and in so in such uh, working uh, and lasting, help create a kind of common world. You can see the importance of work for politics in that sense, uh, because what work does is uh, uh, make us um, political in the sense that it gives us something uh, common that unites different people 
uh, into a common people. Um, I, I should say, and I think this is important, and I think I've said it, these distinctions of work, labor, and action are blurred. They're not supposed to be like, you know, the point is not to say this is work and that's labor and that's action. They're all blurred so that there are um, something like a meal, which is, of course, consumption, because it's going to be eaten, can become a kind of work if it, uh, uh, you know, creates a uh, creates a, if we take a picture of it or if we hold on to it and it becomes a kind of memory and it also becomes an action. It's something we do that we could then tell stories about and that meal will last uh, over time. Uh, and so these are, these are flexible uh, categories. Um, the point is not to make, to make them, uh, you know, to not, you know, the point is not to sort of make rigid distinctions, but to see uh, the importance of what she's saying as different aspects of these activities. Laboring is when we uh, make something work for something in which the end product is not important because the end product is going to be consumed. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die. It's going to be consumed. It's not going to last. Whereas work is an activity in which we make something in which the end product is going to last. Thus, labor is, as we talked about the last few classes or meetings, I apologize, is a cycle. We labor, we produce, we consume, we labor, we produce, consume with no end. Whereas um, work has a beginning point. We think of something we want to create, whether it's a table or a artwork, and we create it. And then we have the thing. And while the thing may eventually decay or disappear, it will last, and that lastingness of the thing is what separates it from a product of labor. Okay, are there um, questions about section 18 or, or anything I've said uh, so far? Um, in many ways, I think this is just setting out the basic premises, but um, it's important and, and I'm happy to answer any questions about them that you might have. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Hi, Roger. Roger, I'd like to ask, ask a question, if I can. Yes. Uh, uh, already at the beginning of the chapter, uh, the second page, she tells us about the relationship between the identity uh, and uh, the work. And I know already that she makes an uh, important uh, relation between the revelation of the agent and the discourse. But when we, we talk about uh, work, she's talking uh, inevitably about violence. And so I'd like you to, if you can, if you would elaborate the relation between the identity that is revealed to discourse, which, uh, uh, which is a nonviolent kind of uh, action, and the work, the, 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 the importance of the work to the stabilization of this identity, which inevitably comes with uh, 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 some kind of inevitable violence. If you could elaborate it for me, I would like it very much, please. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to. So, um, work is for her violence uh, because whenever you make something, uh, whether you make a table or a story, uh, you have to um, stabilize uh, something, right? So if you make a table, you take wood, which was growing as a tree and which had its own natural processes and was going to grow and die, and you take that wood and you stabilize it so that it's going to last as a table for however long that table is going to last. And so it's a violation of nature. It's a violation of the natural process. Uh, in, in the same way, uh, if you take a story, let's say um, the American Revolution, just to take one, and uh, uh, Paul Revere riding and, and lighting up the lanterns. I, mean, I don't know if this is a universal story for everyone here, or the story of Socrates 
uh, uh, you know, uh, deciding to drink the poison hemlock rather than escape and saying uh, that it's better to suffer wrong than do wrong. You're taking a very complicated historical process and doing violence to it and isolating one aspect of it and preserving it, okay? So in both those cases, and in any case of work, she says, by stabilizing an event or by stabilizing a tree, <laughs> you are violating the motion of history and the motion of life. Um, in doing so, you're creating a durable story or a durable table that lasts that creates a kind of sameness in the world, a durability. And I, and that we know that despite our differences, there's something that unites us in knowing the story of Socrates. And despite our different food preferences or the different way we eat, we have the same table. And that table provides a kind of marker that grounds us as people who share a common world in some way. And so, for her violence, the violence against the processes of nature, the human violence against the process of nature is absolutely essential. Um, it's one of the reasons, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about this in the section on action, the chapters on action, in which, you know, she says that great acts of violence, while we don't like them in, in many ways, like uh, uh, American conquering the Indians or, or the Native Americans, or uh, um, I don't know, uh, uh, the US beating Hitler, right? Big acts of violence. But these acts of violence, as bad as they are, create stories and create stabilization and create identities, which are the very core of, of, of the human world and thus of politics. And so for her, violence uh, is a necessary uh, uh, cor corollary of work and thus of the human world. Um, is that, does that help your question, Raphael? Yes, thank you very much, Roger. You're very welcome. I see a question from John Bevan, who writes, what you said about work and action being related to community makes one wonder if the current dominance of labor is an anti-communal element, el influence. Um, so I, I didn't use the word community, John, but but I think you're fi it's fine to use it I talked about a common world, um, which uh, is a kind of communal uh, element. Uh, and so I'm happy with the word community to a certain extent. Uh, it's not her word, but but it's it, it, it will do. Um, and the answer to your question is yes. Uh, in fact, the thesis of this book, in the end, at least I'm going to suggest to you as we get through the book, and it will even start to come out today, is that the victory of labor over work and action uh, is destroying the common world. Uh, that is in many ways, at, le at least one of the theses of this book. Uh, and that the, uh, the victory of labor, the rise of labor um, is destroying the humanly built human common world. And we're even gonna get into that in, in, in section 20, which we're gonna end with today. So um, I'm going to move on to section 19 quickly because I want to get to section 20, which is sort of, I think, the most interesting of our, of our reading today. So chapter 19 is on reification. Uh, reification is a word that many people use. Uh, it's a complicated word, but let me just tell you what it means. It comes from res. Uh, res in Latin means thing. And so uh, if you want to think of a good translation of it, it means thingification. It means to thingify. And um, the point here is that the essence of work is that it creates things. Things that in, are in the world, the thing in the world. And it does so through violence, right? This is where Raphael was asking his question from. Uh, she says, this element of violation and violence is present in all fabrication. And fabrication is reification. It's the creating of solid things in the world. Um, there's an interesting distinction she makes at the bottom of this page, going on to the next page in the footnote three, uh, which is that when humans create things, make things, 
there's a difference between what she calls medieval thingification, creating, in which we create things, um, but we do so uh, sort of in this creative sense where we take things that are given to us and we create things um, from them. Uh, um, but we, we are sort of dependent upon a plan beyond ourselves, God's plan, nature's plan, et cetera. Verse, what she calls the modern thing, modern practice of reification or thingification in which we think of ourselves as able to take the world and remake it and make things not in line with God's laws, but within our own laws. Uh, and we become Lord and master of the earth. And that's uh, one key distinction uh, within the idea of thingification um, uh, that she that she is is talking about. Um, another another important distinction in this section is she wants to say that uh, in reification or thingification and thus in work, um, we always begin with an with a model with a guide. Uh, outside of our head, um, this is not purely subjective. Uh, we we have an idea of, of of making a bed or a table, and we have that idea um, because of an idea outside of us. This is to go back to Plato. The ideas um, we don't sort of just it doesn't come from our subjective brain. It comes from something in the world. Uh, we have beds because the world needs beds. Um, now, obviously, that had to start somewhere, but she says that, you know, whenever we create things to a large extent, uh, and I think even to a full extent, uh, there's a communal need, there's ideas, there's common drives, models that are outside of our, our subjective uh, experience. The importance of this is that the bed may eventually break and need to be thrown out but it's a bed and the idea of a bed lasts and so even more durable and lasting than the bed or the table are the ideas of the bed and the table um which creates uh, a lasting common uh idea of the world so that work is based on uh, actually um, a common a common background. Um, that's what I'm going to say about chapter 19, uh, so that we have some time to go to chapter 20, um, which is the most interesting, I think. Are there questions about um, chapter 19? Happy to answer any, but uh, I think we'll find chapter 20 really uh, quite rich and worthy of uh, spending most of our time on it. Okay, uh, if there are, interrupt me, let me know. Uh, so chapter 20 uh, is called Instrumentality and Animal Laborons. Uh, the laboring animal. Um, so uh, instrumentality here is is an important word. Uh, on the one hand, um, humans who make something, right? Homo faber, ma fabricating man, artificing man, the man who makes the artificial world, the world that lasts, the durable world, and thus the world that unites plural and 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 unique individuals. Um, uh, relies on tools, right? You, you, you make things, whether it's a, 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 a table, you need tools. Uh, and if you're even going to make a, a, an artwork, you need paintbrushes. And if you need stories, you need uh, words. Uh, you need tools to, to make anything. Um, so he, she says on 144, we're going to do a little more reading here because here things get quite interesting and important. About eight lines into the chapter, 
Tools and instruments are so intensely worldly objects that we can classify whole civilizations using them as criteria. Right, so we have the Bronze Age, that's what she's thinking of, the, the Iron Age, um, the Machine Age, uh, things of that sort. Tools uh, not only last, right, picks and axes and things, but uh, determine the kind of things we make in the world so that tools um, really do influence and, 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 and help create different kinds of worlds. Then she continues, nowhere, however, is there a worldly character more manifest than when they are used in the labor process, where they are indeed the only tangible things that survive both the labor and consumption process itself. So, I mean, again, let's use our basic example of labor, making bread. When we're done making bread, the, the bread is gone, we eat it, but the, uh, the oven or the bread pan or the the mixer or whatever it is we use uh, survives. Um, um, so therefore, for the animal laborans, the laborer, which is subject to and constantly occupied with the devouring processes of life, the durability and stability of the world are primarily represented in the tools and instruments it uses. I think it's fairly simple. The, the laborer, you know, Keeps you know the baker uses the same rolling pin etc. and that's what in a sense uh, keeps his world stable. It's not the bread he or she makes. Um, the second step that she wants to make on page 145 is to say that in laboring, uh, there's a loss of distinction between means and ends. Right when you make the bread. The bread is not an end so far as it's to be consumed. It's what? It's a means for life. And insofar as the bread becomes a means for life, uh, it's, there's, there's not a distinction uh, between means and ends. As we've said over and over again, the laboring is a cyclical process. Um, and there's a second thing she wants to add this add to this now uh, at the bottom of this page and then footnote eight, which is that in laboring as a result of that, the tools we use um, are in a sense uh, outside, lose the character of being uh, outside of man. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, to the extent, you know, let's think about baking for a sec. You know, when you're you're rolling the baking pin, right? And you go like this and this and this. The pin, the pin, the baking pin, in a sense, or when you're stirring it and you're doing this, to the extent you get a rhythm going and you get going and you start singing a song, right? You sort of meld together almost uh, uh, with your tool. Um, and there's what she calls a rhythmic uh, unification of the laboring body with its element. And the more sort of lab the more quintessential your labor, uh, the more rhythmic it is, the more you, in a sense, lose the distinction between uh, tool and your hands or your body. And uh, the tools, in a sense, disappear uh, as, as separate. And she has this footnote about labor songs and works and how there's this that that in real labor, uh, you sort of want to lose the connection with the outside world and you want to become at one with your laboring. Um, and that in laboring, you sort of lose your attention. You become sort of in a spiritual trance. And uh, she cites these labor theorists of the 19th century. Uh, Carl Busha and others who are saying this is why labor is sort of spiritual and why it's so great because in labor we lose ourselves and she's saying not so much uh, this is not such a good thing um, in a sense it demands less attention and thus it's less human and more a, 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 a reduction of human work to the kind of laboring um, uh, body. Uh, 
Um, are there any questions about that before I, I move on? Because we're about to sort of jump into, uh, in many ways, the, the the core of the of the chapter. Okay, so what she then says next, beginning on page 147, with the paragraph, the decisive difference between tools and machines, right? This is really where things start getting super interesting. Um, she wants to make a distinction between tools on the one hand, which she calls tools of workmanship, and in tools of workmanship, the work remains the servant of the hands. Okay, what does that mean? Well, when I build a table, I'm thinking there's an idea of the table or I know I want a table and I tell my hands to build the wood, cut down the tree, do violence to it, saw it, do violence to it and make a table. So the work remains the servant of my hands and my head. But when I start working with machines, Arendt says, um, I often can become a, a, a servant of, of the machine. I adjust to the machine. Now, there's going to be different levels of this argument uh, that she wants to make, because on one hand, we also adjust to the saw. And if I use a, 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 a dull saw or a sharp saw or an electric saw, uh, you know, my work is going to be different and I, and I, um, adjust to them. Um, but she's going to make an argument that there is a real difference between the adjustment to, um, non machine like tools and the adjustment to mechanical machine like tools. Uh, so what is that? On the bottom of 147, she says, as is so frequently the case with historical developments, it seems as though the actual implications of technology, that is the replacement of tools and implements with machinery, have come to light only in its last stage with the advent of automation. So now what she's going to do on pages 148 to 150 is tell a story a three-stage story of the stages of technology. And so I just want to outline these three stages. The first one is the uh, stage of technology understood as the steam engine. These are all modern technologies. The steam engine takes uh, natural uh, processes, namely um, the fact that water can turn a wheel, and imitates it. And instead of uh, water, uses steam, which has advantages because you don't need to bring uh, a, a, an ocean into the boat or an ocean into the train or a river. You can do it through steam and through a machine that's more portable and useful. Um, and so these machines imitate natural processes. Um, and they're simply increase the power that we would have with our hand turning a wheel. Um, so uh, in, in, in one sense, the second stage is the stage of electricity um, in which the, the thing about electricity is that it's not natural, right? There's, I mean, we have lightning, right? But the electricity creates something um, in which we're not just uh, enlarging our ability to turn a wheel uh, with water or with steam, um, we're actually creating something that uh, nature uh, doesn't have, um, which is electricity uh, in the sense of electricity that comes out of an outlet or, or can be harnessed in this way. Um, we actually have to change uh, the water or the coal or the oil or the natural gas or the sunlight into something that's never existed before, right? This, this kind of electric current. And so we denaturalize nature for our own worldly ends. And in doing so, and here's this, the, the important step on this level at the bottom of 148, 
Today, we have begun to, and it's in quotes, create, as it were. That is to unchain natural processes of our own. To unchain natural processes of our own. We create something like electricity. And in creating something like electricity, electricity, which really was not a thing in the world before, um, becomes a process that will uh, have um, un, a, a kind of infinite and um, uncontrollable uh, outcomes. Things will emerge in the world, right? That would never have emerged simply through nature and without us. I mean, this thing we're talking through, a computer, is just not possible uh, without electricity. And, uh, and it is in some ways part of a process we created with the creation of electricity that simply could not have ever existed without electricity and, and many other uh, things. And so what she says is, instead of carefully surrounding the human artifice with defenses against nature's elementary forces, keeping them as far as possible outside of the man-made world, we have channeled these forces along with their elementary power into the world itself. The result has been a veritable revolution in the concept of fabrication. Manufacturing, which always had been a series of separate steps, has become a continuous process. You know, you had to make, you had to cut down the tree, you had to, you know, sand it, you had to do this, you had to do that, cut it, make the thing. Now, it's on a conveyor belt, it's electric, and it sort of goes. And in fact, what's the end stage of this? Well, we simply create one machine that will do what? Cut the, cut the tree, sand the tree, make the table. Um, and this gives rise to the third stage of modern technology, which is automation. And, and this is where things get interesting for RN, really interesting. Automation, she says on 149, is the most recent stage of the development, and it illuminates the whole history of machinism. She's quoting the book from Diebold, uh, Friedman here, but um, uh, it, the, the main work she's here using is a work by uh, Diebold, John Diebold, Automation and the Advent of the Automatic Factory. But the point is that what, with the rise of automation, and with automation we now have to, six, 70 years after she wrote this book, or 65 years after she wrote this book, we have to add in artificial intelligence, right? Which is what she's really getting at and talking about with, with automation. We have, we come to see what the whole machine age was actually heading towards. The whole machine age was heading towards as she says, the culminating point of the modern development um, is a situation in which fabrication is a continuous process. As she says on the footnote 12, the assembly line is the result of the concept of manufacturing as a continuous process. And automation, one may add, is the result of the machination of the assembly line to the release of human labor power in the earlier stage of industrialization, right? In like the steam engine where we increase labor power. Automation adds the release of human brain power because quote, the monitoring and control tasks now humanly performed will be done by machines, right? This is what we're currently experiencing really right now where we're not just replacing physical labor with machines, we're also replacing intellectual labor with machines, whether it's advanced stock trading or whether it's um, uh, quality control in factories, right? You don't longer, we don't even trust a human to test uh, a Coke bottle or a pen to see if it's made well and if it's safe or it explode. We have machines do it because machines are more reliable, uh, they don't get sick, 
They don't get tired. They don't have a bad day. They don't let one go by because they just like feeling like it. And machines are better at actually um, not only doing physical labor, but actually doing the kind of brain work um, that uh, traditionally humans, um, even in the earlier machine age, were thought uh, to be to be human. Uh, the result of this for Arendt is that there's no respect left in labor and in factory work. The worker has simply become um, uh, 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 a kind of physical uh, uh, body who um, really does nothing unique and nothing that can't in the end replaced, be replaced by a machine. Uh, this is, of course, some of you are following many of these uh, uh, many of these developments in, in the world today. Um, this is what's happening. We're replacing, I mean, some of the uh, most interesting examples of this are, are the IBM computer Watson, which is, you know, really going to replace something that we often thought was irreplaceable, which is not only the doctor as surgeon, which is already happening. You're starting to have computers do surgery. And even when doctors do surgery now, they often do it with a joystick. And the advantage of using the joystick with LASIK surgery and others is that since you have to do very precise movements, if whatever happens, you sneeze or you make a bigger movement than you're supposed to, the computer corrects your movement, right? So we, we actually use computers to, 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 to prevent mistakes by, by, by humans. Um, but you know, even in things like babysitting and childcare and teaching, uh, we are in a very quick pace uh, experimenting with, with robot nannies and robot bear caregivers. Um, and I've, I, I gave a, a one day university lecture about two or three months ago on, on a number of these new companies and new robots that are, you know, being tested right now, which many people think do a better job of securing the safety, but also the well-being and intellectual and moral development of children than babysitters. And they're going to end up being cheaper, more reliable. And, uh, and, you know, so you're going to have children, at least in the poorer areas of the world, uh, relying on machines to raise children. And what that means for how these children will grow up, grow up well, whether they will be human or something else. Well, they'll be human in a human sense, in a natural sense, but the condition in which they grow up will, will change dramatically. So um, Arendt is talking about this uh, transformation and the rise of automation. Um, and uh, okay. There's one more step to her argument in this chapter, and it's about the channeling of natural forces into processes. And I want to talk about that. But before I do, if there's a question about what I've said so far, because um, I think it's quite interesting, uh, I'm happy to answer that and then go into this final section on, on processes. Uh, <clears throat> Roger Harold Bush. Um, just a, uh, a comment. My uh, area of study is around uh, Shoah, specifically around uh, Auschwitz. And what occurred to me as I was reading this is that uh, we could look at the Einsatztruppen as using a tool. And when it became no longer possible using that tool to create the production of death, the industrialization of death came about in Auschwitz where uh, an individual didn't actually kill anyone. You ushered people into a gas chamber, they were gassed. Um, and then because they weren't being fed, uh, the fat quantity in their body was so low that a machine was developed to crush the bones so that they would actually burn to completion in the crematoria. And they didn't use sledgehammers to do that, they used a machine. So you weren't actually crushing the bodies, you were just moving the bodies in the machine, and then from there, of course, moving them into the crematoria, all of which was automated, as opposed to the situation where you had an Einsatztruppen and shooting someone falling into a ditch or something like that. And it, it was instructive to me to 
uh, to bring in, in, in my talks about this, this, this concept uh, that she has of moving from the tool in the relationship of the human being to the tool. And when it becomes automation, you're disconnected. Thank you, Harold. That's that's exceptionally good. Um, I, and I think what you're saying is absolutely right. It's when you you know when you when you have to kill someone with your bare hands and your hands are a tool, or with a sword, right? As much as you're still killing them, there's a connection. There's a worldly connection between you and that person. You see their eyes, etc. I mean the the advance of warfare with the longbow right at at, at Agincourt uh to to bombs and now to drones where warfare is being uh carried out now with with joysticks and with buttons um is 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 creating a kind of uh de-worldliness of of warfare which makes it uh much easier to kill um, your, your example of, of, of the way if you want to kill people and you want to do so efficiently, uh, uh, the extent you can mechanize it as a process, um, makes it seem like there's less of your will in it. It's simply, I'm not killing, I'm simply putting them in the next stage of the machine. I mean, this was in a sense what Eichmann did as well, right? I'm not a killer. I simply did the train timetables. Uh, and to the extent your job is simply to keep the process going, right? You don't actually have to take responsibility for the act. And you can actually say, I'm not killing. I'm pushing the button on the, on the, uh, on the gas. I'm pushing the on, button on the machines that scoops up and crushes the bones. And so um, this is part of the uh, the way in which um, what she's saying is there's a dehumanization um, of this world, and the way in which the um, we become we begin to think less about what we're doing and more about how we have to keep the processes going. And that's where the next step goes, right? She says on page 150, in the about right after footnote 13, about eight, 10 lines down, if present technology consists of channeling natural forces into the world of the human artifice, right? So we channel electricity into the world of the human artifice. Future technology may yet consist of channeling the universal forces of the cosmos around us into the nature of the earth. This is the most complicated part of what she wants to say. It remains to be seen whether these future technologies will transform the household of nature as we have known it since the beginning of our world to the same extent or even more than the present technology has changed the very worldliness of the human artifice. So the present technology changes the worldliness of the human artifice insofar as Harold is saying, we, we don't see the the tool as a gun that we made that we control. We see the tool as a button or a process that we simply are part of and that it controls us. We simply push the button because that's our job. Um, but the next step is that the channeling of natural forces into the human world has shattered the very purposefulness of the world. We no longer see ourselves as the purpose givers. We don't make the decisions about what's happening. What have we done? We've created, as, as Harold was saying, with the, with, the, uh, with the gas chambers, we've created machines that run themselves. What do the machines need? Well, they need material. So our job is to feed the material into the machines. Um, so the fact, she says, that objects are the ends for which tools and implements are designed means if means that we are actually trying to create the machine, the gun, etc. But 
when we don't see the machine as the end, the gun as the end, but we see the end as a process of just killing, uh, then um, we shatter the purpose. We we shatter the fact that we are in control of 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 the world and of the things that we make in the world. And she talks about how there's two kinds of processes. There's a natural process, and there's a historical process, and then there's going to be what's called um, uh, um, a social process, which is like his, a historical process. The natural process comes from nature, natura, fusis, to grow of itself. Um, and the world has a process. That's what life is. It's the cycle of life. Um, and if you turn to page 151 at the very top, she says, if we see these processes against the background of human purposes, which have a willed beginning and a definite end, they assume the character of automatism. We call automatic all courses of movement, which are self-moving and therefore outside the range of willful and purposeful interference. So here's the key sentence. Once we create such processes based on laws of nature or laws of history, so communism, which says, you know, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a dictatorship of the proletariat where we'll have to change human nature, which will lead to a communist utopia. Well, killing people like Stalin did becomes not killing people. It becomes fulfilling the natural laws of history. Um, and so she says at the bottom of the next paragraph, so on the, about five lines up from the bottom of 151, the question is not so much whether we are masters or slaves of our machines, right? That's what we often say. Are we, do we become slaves of the machines? We hear this question all the time. That's not the real question. The question is whether machines still serve the world and its things, or if on the contrary, they and the automatic motion of their processes have begun to rule and to even destroy the world of things. The point is that it's not just that we serve our machines, which we do, but that the machines are not even working towards an end that we can create or we, we set. So we're now creating machines to, um, to make art, to, uh, um, trade stocks to do surgery uh, to um, create new machines, right? Computers that create new computers and or play chess. Let's talk about a chess playing computer. That the 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 standards that the machines use are not human standards of beauty or utility, but standards that the machine creates. So if we create a machine that will raise our children. They're not raising them to the way humans think children should be raised. They're going to raise them in the most efficient and best and even better potentially way possible, but it's a machine standard, not a human standard. And so what she's suggesting at the very bottom of 152 is that for a society of laborers, this is the paragraph at the bottom, the world of machines has become a substitute for a real world. We begin to create a world in which what's lasting and enduring is not a, a, a world that conforms to human standards and human ideals of beauty or utility, but uh, of mechanized standards. Um, and this is what she calls a process. And this word process is going to become quite uh, important as we move forward through this book. And so um, I hope you'll pay attention to it. Uh, but but for now, let me end there and spend a little time if there are questions or comments, uh, further questions or comments about this. Yeah. Um, can you hear me, Roger? Um, so what I wanted to touch on, which uh, everything that you're talking about and that Harold also made me think of, um, was what Arendt talks about in Origins um, and the, the superfluous human being. 
and the way that what you're talking about now seems like a, you know, a, a potentially dangerous next step in that problem that we faced, you know, in the early 20th century with human beings becoming superfluous. I think that's exact. That's exactly right, and that's what she's talking about. Um, you know, there's the what, what we're talking about is um, we don't. Not only do we not need human labor increasingly, um, but we increasingly don't need humans to decide what machines to build, right? I mean, how do we decide how to build the next airplane? Well, we have computers doing simulations of what's the safest and fastest airplane. Um, they can think so much faster and better than humans um, that if they create an airplane that looks different and works differently than what humans could have come up with, uh, we will often prefer that. And so where do we need humans in that process? I'm not suggesting that we'll get rid of all humans. I don't think that's likely, certainly not in the near future. Um, but I do think more and more human labor will be superfluous. I mean, you're seeing that right now. I mean, you know, there's a big debate going on in economics about, you know, okay, in, in the 19th century, as farming became automated, people moved to the cities and there was a years of displacement, but eventually new jobs were created. And some economists think that this is just a temporary blip and others think that we're under a fundamental shift. And far be it for me to say what's the right answer, um, but it does seem that, at least from a, um, an economic point of view, most labor is going to be superfluous. We will be able to create enough food, housing, and basic goods to keep people alive um, and happy um, with very few human laborers. And what that means is that the vast majority of the human population will be economically superfluous. Um, the, the old, uh, the, the, uh, the Larry Ellison, the founder of Oracle, uh, framed this in a bar one night in a famous, which has now become an apocryphal and, and famous remark, where he says, most of the world will become superfluous because of automation and computers. And um, we will have to make a decision whether to keep those people alive at a cost at an unnecessary cost to ourselves uh, or kill them. And he says, as a result, altruism becomes the defining question of our era. Um, you know, I think it's a fairly stark uh, claim, but I don't think it's wrong. Um, and uh, I think one of the great questions of our time is how to, uh, you have a choice, either to somehow make people not superfluous or somehow develop an ethics in which superfluous people are seen as worth keeping alive and, and making happy. Uh, and that is, I think, very much the challenge of our time, or one of them. I see a question from Kantaro. With automation, one does less. Press a button instead of use a hammer to crush the bones of a body. The outcome is the same, death of the victim, saving or of a life. However, if less is done, is the action less evil, less responsible? Um, I, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think that's that's very much the question of bureaucratic responsibility. Um, uh, you know, uh, if a bureaucrat simply signs a paper or pushes a button or you know puts a stamp on a paper, is that bureaucrat less or more responsible, uh, Kentaro, than than somebody uh, else? And uh, who, 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 you know, who sticks the knife in? Who's more responsible, the judge or the executioner? Right? Um, uh, you know, I think the Israeli Supreme Court in the Eichmann trial articulated it that in bureaucratic uh, uh, societies, responsibility actually increases the further you are away from the actual doing of the act, uh, uh, which is a, a view that Arendt endorsed in the Eichmann book and I think is largely right. Um, uh, I think what you see is that, you know, the further away you are from the act, the more responsible you are in our world. You know, in the, in the, in the torturing trials uh, in the United States uh, during the Iraq war, 
the fact that we convicted almost nobody, but the few people we convicted were the low-level foot surge for soldiers, and no one in Washington uh, was convicted, um, uh, was a real uh, tragedy of the, uh, if you believe, as Arendt does, that the responsibility actually increases the further you are away from the crime. We're at an hour. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, we're going to have a lot more time to discuss these questions uh, as this book goes along. These, this is the core of, of much of what Arendt is doing. And so um, if you didn't get to ask a question today, there'll be more. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you all for, for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.